And that's partly, certainly, what we're talking about tonight. Should we go on from this? Our next step, as I think you know, is then to submit an option to provincial fisheries, which follows once we are approved as an optionee, then it moves to a formal process of permitting, which involves more public consultation, as well as consulting agencies, Transport Canada, DFO, uh, other, all the other agencies, environment and the like, are all consulting agencies to provincial fisheries for the actual permit process, which would begin if we apply for an option. A little bit of slow problem with the movement of the, I can work manually. Okay, so among the elements of a sanctuary are an education center. So what kinds of education would this be? We've talked about it before. This might be an education center in town, unlikely given the site we're talking about, that it could be on the site. So this would be separated from the site where the whales are, but a place where children and adults can come. They can learn about the whales, there would be interpretation, there would be virtual reality displays, there would be remote webcams, underwater cameras, above water cameras from the sanctuary, as well as educational elements directly related to whales generally. So it becomes educational, not only about the belugas that are actually in the sanctuary, but about cetaceans and whales generally. So to provide a little more specificity, what are we actually talking about with an educational center? Exhibits on the lives of each of the belugas that we have. So those are changing over time. As belugas, they will, belugas will die. Others would replace them, as we've talked. This would be a maximum of five to eight whales that would ever be in the sanctuary at any one time. Educational displays, interactive educational programs for children and adults, seminars, films, lecture series. Where would it be? Possibly part of the proposed lifestyle center that's being talked about and discussed here in town, and possibly elsewhere along Highway 7 in Sheet Harbor. That's to be determined but it wouldn't be on the site. How would it be funded? Just as Lori mentioned a minute ago, it would be funded in exactly the way that the project is funded generally, through philanthropic donations, through people that are already donating money. I think we've mentioned in other meetings, but just to give you a sense of that, our lead donor has committed a million dollars to the project. Another woman has already matched that million dollars. Now that's nothing compared to what we need to raise for a project that's 15, 18 million dollars. But it shows the commitment of just two individuals. There are another 750 other donors who are part of the project already. And the capital campaign begins once there's a specific site to identify for people so that they can see that's the site that they're beginning to fund. So that's the process that comes going forward, that's some of the elements of the education center. I need a new Okay, so we've also talked about the educational and the economic benefits. So there are jobs. These are the kind of jobs generally that exist. Animal care providers, veterinary services, interpretive center operations, education and outreach coordinators, there's food service, there's housing for non-local staff. This is a project that roughly will employ on a full-time basis 20 people. There'll be temporary jobs in the summers as well, and there'll be all kinds of internships. And also we see this as an opportunity to demonstrate conservation leadership, certainly locally and for the province, nationally, and frankly, there's global attention for this as well. To be a little more specific, what are the jobs that could be local? Because I think that's been a question that's been asked at some of our meetings. So specifically, what are those? Certainly, during construction, there'll be temporary jobs. Also, there'll be permanent jobs in what I describe as marine operations, 
all of the boat services that we have. So it's boat operators, it's tending of the nets, and certainly there's an ongoing requirement, both mechanically and with human skill, to clean the nets and repair them. Security personnel, on-site naturalists, as well as interpretive center operations in the, in the education center nearby, education and outreach coordinators that could be based in that center, animal care providers initially, there may not be local people who are qualified to be animal care providers, but certainly with training, they can be. We did that in Iceland with the Free Willing Project. Initially, it was all of our own staff, but then we trained local Icelandic people to be animal care providers, and they joined that team. That's the kind of job that could happen with training. Maintenance personnel, certainly. So how many full-time jobs are we talking about locally out of the 20 that I'm talking? Roughly seven to 10 permanent full-time jobs is what I would see likely to be the case. And then additional part-time jobs and internships would also be part of it. So it's a little more specificity about the jobs. So the area we're talking about, you all know. It's the area between the gates and Malagash Island, but this picture helps because it describes why it's such a, a good site, why we're here, why it's a wonderful site, for all the same reasons that it's a wonderful location for all of you. It's because it's well protected from the southwest, from the southeast, from the south, as well as the land masses to the north. It's an area that has a number of other features as well. So with a little closer view. So obviously, closer view, Malagash and the Gibbs. It has flow through it. It has current. It has depth. So from a physical standpoint alone, it's a special site. And I think as you've heard in these other meetings, we've looked at around 130 sites in British Columbia the province of Nova Scotia and Washington State. Of those 130 sites, we've done in-depth analysis of probably 30 of them. From a physical standpoint, this is an exceptional site. So even though we have the level of intensity of feeling that's here in this room tonight, that we've heard before, and the concerns that exist it's an important site to give full consideration to. And that's why we're going through the process that we're going through with the level of detail that we are. So this was what we talked about in a previous town meeting. This is the previous plan that we described where we would provide a net or lay a net from Malagash to West Gibbs as well as to East Gibbs and close off the area between the two. And this is that plan that closes the gates that we talked about some months ago and that you've all heard about. We understand that that doesn't work for you. And so given that, what we're talking about now is a plan that has a summer configuration and a winter configuration. Roughly six months summer, six months winter is the way we've looked at this. So that we would have a summer plan that's roughly 25 hectares that is really nets solely connected to Malagash. Leaving the gates open from roughly April 1st through October. That kind of a plan. The dates can be described, we can work out details. What we're trying to convey is that there's an opportunity to try to work with everyone to see if we can accommodate the concerns that have been raised. In the winter months, we would close the gates by laying the net, extending the net to the, to the Gibbs Islands, and this net would have a gate in it so whales can move between it. So this is a, a proposal that we think responds to some, although certainly not all of the concerns we've heard, a winter and a summer configuration. Thank you, Lord. 
Now, this is a little harder to see, and particularly for you in the back, but I want to give some description because we've been asked, well, what happens on Maladash? What, you know, we know there are some whales in the water. What else is going on? So we would have a plan to have some of our facilities on the crown land of Maladash. And we have met with crown lands, and they've seen this proposal. We've discussed it with them. So there would be two or three buildings roughly this size. If you can see this little yellow block, that's actually to scale for the buildings. What would be in there? We would have our animal care facilities in there, the freezers for their fish, as well as the freezers in that building. There have to be the tubs to thaw the fish, to check each fish individually to make sure it's suitable for consumption, and to then provide them to the, to the animals. We also have an office for our staff, and we have maintenance buildings as well. The yellow dotted line that you have here is what we would propose as a nature trail or a path where our team can observe the whales throughout the whole area, as well as for visitors and guests, and we'll come to that in a moment as to how that could work. We might have one or two viewing platforms there because there's a little bit of a rise in the topography where there's the telescopes or binoculars that you've seen for nature trails and the like that could be in that area. So that gives you a little better sense of what we would be doing. Now there also obviously has to be a road to access that. We haven't drawn it because it has to be engineered, but there would indeed have to be a way to access those buildings from uh, Blue Water Road. Blue Water? Yeah, Blue Water. Yeah. Blue, grass, blue grass, thank you. Get the road right. So then there have also been certainly concerns about traffic and the like in the area. So what are some ways to accommodate traffic in the area? Because that's a legitimate and an important concern. So ways to deal with that is that we too don't think there ought to just be people coming to a sanctuary all day whenever they want. That doesn't work for the staffing plan we have. It doesn't work for how we want the animals to be interacted with by other people. So what we would do is we would have reservations required for on-site visitors, not an uncommon plan for all kinds of public facilities. We might have signage at Route 7, Highway 7, and Mushaboom Road, telling people and directing them to the interpretive center that's off-site where their reservations can be made as well as they could be made online. We might also establish specific hours tour when tours are available so that that's well planned in advance and organized. So how do we restrict access to the area so that it doesn't just happen willy-nilly anyway? We perhaps could have a kiosk and parking somewhere near St. Paul's Anglican Church or Powers Road. It would have to be determined how that could be done and how it can be accommodated, but you put some parking there, and the only way visitors can actually access the site is with a small shuttle that we would run to bring them down during the specific hours when that's open. There to be, as I said, required reservations, limits on the number of cars, and limits on the number of visitors. All things that conditional use permits for all kinds of projects often require, and we could require it of ourselves in order for this to work in a way that makes more sense. So I want to give you some, now that doesn't mean this is the way it has to happen. What Laura and I and Catherine and the Whale Sanctuary Project team are trying to do in this context is demonstrate that working with you, there are approaches to try to resolve some of the concerns that have been raised. There's also been quite a bit of discussion about ice. And in fact, it's an issue. And there's no question. So we have looked at the 46 years of ice records that are available. <coughs> and basically, there's been ice in the area in 14 of those years, and the data you know, is not as good as the data that some of you have by living adjacent to it. But the data that exists is 
that roughly the heavy ice is certainly between the end of January and the end of March are the strongest periods of ice in the area. 1993 was the most severe year of any. 79, 82, and 87 were substantial. Most of the ice is new ice. It's defined as that ice that bends under swells and waves. <laughs> swells and waves. And uh, under pressure. And also, so how do we deal with that? And how has that been dealt with elsewhere in facilities of this nature? By using different kinds of aeration in the water, by certainly having the ability to break it up at times when it's very severe, and the whales will generally congregate very close together at that time, and having ways that their bubble walls and the like to break it up. So there are techniques to deal with it. It requires certainly more study, but since I was here a couple of weeks ago, and we were here well, a couple of months ago as well, we have taken the time to look at this with the data that exists, and we've done it in two ways. Looking at the ice records that exist, and also taking all of the satellite data that exists on a day-to-day -day basis and overlaying the two different data sets for that. So that's an approach to looking at a given issue, seeing if there are strategies to deal with it, and moving from there to figure out if there's a plan for it. So where are we in a sense now? We're at the next steps of community planning. If we go forward beyond this evening and beyond today, there would be more community planning. We could then initiate a process to apply for an option with provincial fisheries. Following that, there would be further engineering analyses, which are required and part of the formal permitting process. So that's really where we are. And for us, it's always been the same. We think the project is critically important. We think this is an excellent site in which to do it, and a community that we would like to try to work with further than we have to date. If we're able to, we think it has benefits for your children, certainly for the province and the community, as well as nationally and internationally. So with that, we would like to turn this to an open mic evening. What we hope we've conveyed is that we are listening we want to continue to listen to you and see if we can respond to concerns that you have, similar to as we have begun to already. Thank you very much.